Good morning, everybody, and welcome to episode 13 of GSO Ocean Classroom Live. I'm going to do my best Rhode Island broadcaster, Frank Coletta, coffee cup salutes, best part about morning uh, Ocean Classroom Live events. We can do this. Uh, hello to our audiences out there on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Periscope, through Twitter, um, and always thank you to the Devereaux Ocean Foundation for their support for today's episode. So my name is Holly Morin. I'm a marine biologist and science communicator with the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. And just like always, or before, I will be your host today uh, for today's program. And as all of our programs have been, I want to remind everybody, we want to keep things super conversational. Um, and so you you can ask your questions at any time today. They're really important uh, to the success of today's uh, program. Um, and you can ask your questions by typing them into the comment box or the chat box that's there on Facebook. Um, same thing on YouTube. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions during today's program. I'm actually going to kick things off uh, like I usually do now and ask all of you, where are you tuning in from today? What city? What state? Let us know. Type it in there to that chat box and we'll check in with you all in a little bit. So while you're typing in your answers, remember you wanna follow along uh, with uh, your IGSO and the Inner Space Center on YouTube and Facebook. So you can stay up to date uh, on these episodes and other programs and plans that we have coming up. And if you're watching a replay, welcome, welcome. You can also type in your questions and we'll check in with, uh, with all of you on social media later to see if we have to answer any additional questions. So today's program is, um, the last episode of a three-part series we've been hosting on hurricanes. So we had our first Ocean Classroom episode back on September 24th, and we kind of took a broad overview, a scope of the 2020 season, uh, talking about how it was unique, uh, hurricane uh, impacts and preparedness. And then during our last episode, we had the URI Coastal Resource Center, uh, Teresa Crean. Uh, she was with us and we were talking about uh, the coastal impacts of storms, uh, including hurricanes. Um, and so hopefully some of you have been logging into my coast. That was one of our our um, uh, call to actions at the end there to log the high tides that were coming in recently um, about the right about October 19th, right around there. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about the topic of hurricane models and predictions, forecast products, and all the different tools and technologies that are used to create these models and products. But really important, it's, it's always good to check in where we're at with the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. And although it's mid-October, uh, October is actually the third active month behind August and September for the Atlantic hurricane season. So there's still a lot to monitor. Uh, we've had 26 named storms. So this is only the second time in history where the National Hurricane Center has exhausted its name, uh, its list of 21 names and moved on to the Greek alphabet. The other time this happened was 2005, which most of us remember was the year of Katrina and Rita and other powerful storms. So that was 28 named storms during that season. We're up to 26, so only two storms away from tying it and one away from breaking it. During our last episode, we had Hurricane Delta that was in the Gulf of Mexico. It had already moved across uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, it was a high-end Category 2 at that time, a hurricane with 110 mile per hour winds. It actually made landfall uh, around Creole, Louisiana, the southwest coast of Louisiana. Here are some photos of some of those impacts on October 9th. Uh, this was actually the same area that was impacted by Category 4 Hurricane Laura about 12, uh, six weeks earlier. So this area had just been impacted by a major storm and then had flooding uh, and other impacts. About 12 inches of rain fell in some areas. So you can see this house has been inundated with uh, waters rising. Um, and it was actually, it's very interesting when you think of the storm, it was the fourth named storm of 2020 to actually strike Louisiana and the 10th named storm to make landfall. And that was another record that was broken. Uh, the previous was nine landfalling storms and that was in 1916. It was also the first hurricane with a Greek name to make a landfall in the United States. So. 2020 continues to be a really record-breaking season for hurricanes uh, and tropical systems for sure. So let's check in and see if anybody, if you guys have written in where you all are from today, Newport News, Virginia, welcome. Houston, Texas, fantastic. I went to school in Texas, watching from McKinleyville, California. So now we've got all of our coasts, Annapolis, Maryland. I love this, look at our reach. And then Narragansett just down the road. Always love those locals. This is great guys, Florida as well. Maryland, this is fantastic. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. So flipping back to the season, we actually do have a hurricane that's out in the Atlantic. It's a tropical storm, uh, excuse me, not a hurricane. So we are now moved on to Epsilon. That's the next letter in the Greek alphabet. Um, it's right east of Bermuda and it's gonna kind of skirt the island uh, later today. 
Um, and you can see here, we're going to talk about this a little bit more with our content expert, Mansur, who will be joining us shortly. This is one of our forecast products that we'll be talking about. But it's going to kind of skirt the east coast of Bermuda and then move up into the North Atlantic. There are about 100 mile per hour winds right now. Um, those are sustained winds for Epsilon and gusts are a little bit higher. Uh, but the one thing to note is that there still will be large swells and storm surge, riptides, et cetera, uh, strong currents that will happen along Bermuda, the Greater Antilles, uh, and also the east coast of the United States. So so even though this hurricane is well offshore, this tropical storm, excuse me, is well offshore, it still can impact coastal areas pretty significantly. So I know surfers in Narragansett might be super excited to be out there on the water, but you also definitely want to be really uh, cautious about things. So like I mentioned, this is actually called the, that was a, it's, these details came from the National Hurricane Center's public advisory, which is one of the forecast products that we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, but this advisory is informed by various models uh, and other information that come into the National Hurricane Center. And uh, there's actually the research group at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography that helps to build those model and inform those management decisions. So Mansur Ali Jitan, uh, he's a PhD student in Dr. Isaac Guinness's lab um, at GSO. He is joining us today. And his research focuses on the development of a high resolution surface wind forecast model for land falling hurricanes along the U.S. East Coast. So welcome, Mansur. So happy to have you joining us today. Please say hello to our audiences and tell them a little bit more about yourself. Thank you, Holly, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Holly mentioned, I'm Mansur Ali Jisan. I'm a PhD student at the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. And I'm working with Professor Isaac Guinness on improving the surface wind forecast for landfalling hurricanes. Uh, I'm originally from Bangladesh, a beautiful country in the Southeast Asia, uh, which is very vulnerable to natural hazards like tropical cyclones and monsoon flooding. And then there is the addition of this increasing sea level rise, uh, which is making the situation much more worse. So I'm glad to be here with you all, and I'll be happy to uh, uh, answer your questions and looking for your comments. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Mansur. And that is exactly right. Um, I want to remind everybody that this is all about conversation and um, getting to as many questions and comments that you might have during today's program. So if you have questions about hurricanes, hurricane models, Mansur has a fantastic knowledge base to share about anything and everything hurricanes, actually. Um, different tools or forecast products, definitely type those into the chat box on Facebook, YouTube, etc. And then we'll get to those uh, questions as many as possible. So Mansur, flipping back to the 2020 hurricane season um, and how active um, and kind of record breaking it's been, as somebody who works on modeling these types of storms, maybe you can share a little bit more insight on the season itself. I almost feel like, did you did you predict it? Did your lab foresee that this, would, this type of activity would take place during the season? Yeah, you are right. This has been a very busy Atlantic hurricane season. So you, you already mentioned that we have 26 named storms uh, in the Atlantic, which made it second most active hurricane season right after 2005 Atlantic hurricane season. And during this hurricane season, we have seen storms like Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta, which are major category four storm made landfall in the uh, Gulf Coast. Also, we have seen uh, relatively weaker but highly impactful storms like uh, Hurricane Sally and Hurricane Isaias. So, yeah, uh, we have we have been looking at some uh, really uh, uh, abnormal situations of this hurricane activity this Atlantic season. And another interesting thing that we see this year that 90% of this uh, whole uh, uh, Atlantic uh, whole uh, U.S. shorelines were under the advisory of these tropical cyclones and hurricanes, which we never saw before, probably, I think. And so nine, just bring up that track graph it again, that shows all the different tracks, yeah. And so, right. so if I understand correctly, you're saying 90% of the US coast at some point in time during the season was under a warning? Right, yeah, so 90% of these uh, coasts were under the hurricane advisory at some point this year. So it's, it's been pretty remarkable. And our group, we have been discussing about this a lot uh, during this whole Atlantic hurricane season. Uh, but uh, we mo mainly work on improving the physics behind the model that predicts the track and intensity and the wind field over the land for these hurricanes. But yeah, we are in touch with these uh, informations. And also, if you remember uh, in the late spring, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they released their uh, seasonal hurricane outlook. And it, they also predicted that it's going to be above normal hurricane season. So uh, it was uh, quite expected. And 
Then we also have the cold phase of ENSO, which is called mm -hmm. La Nina. And during the La Nina period, what you notice that weaker wind shear in the Atlantic basin, which has the capability of impeding the formation of the hurricanes. So that was missing this year, which really wells up the storm this year. Actually, that's a um, kind of a great uh, segue into the something I think we didn't really talk about during the first um, episode when we were kind of talking about hurricane basics. We never really got into the life cycle of a hurricane and how they form and then kind of how they decay and end. Um, and where you're talking about wind shear and how that impacts it, great, thank you. Um, if we could walk through those steps, Mansur, if you could walk through the different yeah, steps. Yeah, so sure. Then. So when a hurricane forms, uh, it, uh, it initially generates from a pre-existing disturbance in the atmosphere, and uh, it could be a low pressure system uh, surrounded by some high pressure areas inside the high pressure areas. So once a low pressure system forms in the ocean, and if the sea surface temperature is above 26.5 degrees Celsius or above, and then there is the presence of weak vertical wind shear, then it, it easily intensify the storm and the storm starts intensifying and starts the formation of the tropical depression. And once the depression formed, it starts gradually intensifying depending on the available energy sources like sea surface temperature. And so uh, to, intense, to, to categorize the hurricane intensity, we use a scale called Suffrage-Simpson scale. And Suffrage Simpson scale mainly uh, uses the wind speed of the hurricane to categorize the hurricane life cycle. So it, it starts with the category one storm, which is 74 to 95 miles per hour of wind. And then it could reach up to category five, which is the highest scale in the hurricane category, which is 157 miles per hour. So uh, which has the potentiality of catastrophic damage uh, during the landfall. And then uh, we also have the, uh, when, when, a, when a hurricane forms over the ocean, uh, its primary energy source is mainly the ocean temperature, which is uh, the mainly the sea surface temperature, because when a hurricane moves over the sea surface, it experiences this warm seawater and it easily fuels up the storm during its life cycle. We also have the ocean water beneath the sea surface is also significantly important uh, because there is a, a warm layer beneath the sea surface, which we call the mixed layer, which is around 2.5 meter below the sea surface. And that mixed layer, if it's uh, much deeper, then the hurricane, uh, hurricane brings up the water from the sea surface and that would uh, that warm water, if it's a thicker layer, then it's going to bring out this warmer water from the sea surface, beneath the sea surface. And if the mixed layer is thinner, then it will bring out the cold water easily from the uh, from beneath the sea surface, which uh, which essentially weakens the storm. And then Jess, I think there's actually a graphic that shows that it's two of the the two cross sections of the ocean that show a hurricane over them um, that show different layers of the water and the different temperatures. Um, and what that shows then is that when you have a you can correct me if I'm wrong. There it is. Perfect. Is when you have that warm layer of water, um, that that's really going to fuel your storms. And so when you think of the Gulf, Me Gulf of Mexico or if a hurricane moves over an eddy, which is like a pocket of warm water, it'll rapidly intensify. Intensify, whereas on the left-hand side there, if you have really cool water, you're not going to have a storm that's going to get, um, it won't be able to intensify because it doesn't have that nice pocket of warm water to work with. Yeah, you're right. So you're absolutely correct. So when a hurricane moves over the ocean, so it uh, applies this wind stress uh, over the sea surface and which triggers the mixing below the sea surface, right? So uh, if the water beneath the sea surface is warmer, which we show in the right-hand side of the panel, uh, that just just showed uh, so that one have uh, the potential to uh, not weaken but the intensify but if that layer is thinner then we can get cold water from the deep ocean into the surface and this will uh, ultimately diminish the intensity awesome all righty so we have a question which is great so uh patty prevost would like to know what was the strongest hurricane this season so Mansur, do you, I don't actually, I, I can't quite remember which was out of all 26. So, yeah, so, so this season we have seen, uh, we, we have not seen yet any category five, but 
Uh, we saw two category four, three category four, I think, and two of them made landfall in the Gulf Coast, Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta. Both are category four, very powerful storm. And and then there, I think Hurricane Teddy was also category four, but it never made landfall. It uh, it was over the open ocean and probably it moved uh, over the uh, Newfoundland area. Yeah, and then the other interesting thing with Laura too, I remember, is that's when you had Marco looming in the Gulf too, and we had those two hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico at the same time. Um, I always kept joking because I really felt like they should have had Marco and Polo, and it would have been fantastic. Because I didn't what you were saying the graphics, yeah, really funny. But Laura did make. I feel like they were worried that they were going to crisscross and hit the same um, area. And I think this is actually a, a forecast track or a model Mansur that they have up now showing where Laura's impacts were. Yeah, so when Hurricane Laura was active in the uh, in the Atlantic, uh, uh, we made prediction of the surface wind, and we use a model called Hurricane Boundary Layer Model, which essentially essentially uh, resolves the wind near the surface of the uh, surface of the near the surface. And this one this one was one of the prediction of the wind field, showing the wind field distribution uh, over the land, how the wind field would look like during the landfall of Hurricane Laura. Fantastic. So more questions are coming in, which we always love. So let's take another question here. This is from Karen. What are the animals most at risk to being in danger from these storms? So Mansur, I don't know if you know uh, a lot about biological impacts. I can jump into this a little bit, but if you have an answer, I will let you go first. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh... Yeah, I mean, when a hurricane makes landfall, uh, it impacts everyone, uh, no matter whether it's a human or animals, and mm -hmm. it damages everything along its path, uh, probably starting from the property and then cause damage to the economy also. So, uh, Holly, if you would like to add. Yeah, and then the one thing I remember um, from doing some research for a project that I worked on, uh, the Hurricane Science and Society um, project, and I just remember the one thing when we were looking at potential biological impacts is that migrating birds have actually kind of been picked up and pushed off their path. So you might find a bird in a very random location where they're not supposed to be at all. And it's because they were moving, a lot of times right now, birds, especially in the US are moving south and this is where hurricanes will come across and they might pick up, you might find a tropical bird up in like Pacific, you know, the Pacific coast or something just because they've been pushed so far off their track or it may get carried up to the East coast depending on when they're moving. So that was one thing that always struck me was that birds can actually get shifted around uh, due to hurricanes. And then a lot of people often think of marine life as well. Um, the one thing I can say is that with, um, I have a marine mammal background and with dolphins and whales, et cetera, they live in the ocean all the time. Most of the time they will actually probably sense something is coming and they'll get out of the way and move to a different area away from a storm. Um, um, and they also can move to deeper depths to get away from any of the um, wave action that might be associated uh, with a hurricane. Let's take another question. This is great, guys. Keep them coming. So Priscilla would like to know, is anything in development to lower the intensity of, hung of hurricanes other than cooling the ocean? So Mansur, are you aware of any efforts that might be out there to try to lower the intensity of hurricanes? Yeah. So uh, there have been research going on to reduce the intensity of hurricane. One of them uh, I, I have heard about the wave pump, wave pumps in the uh, in the ocean. So throwing up the wave pumps in the ocean to suck out the cold water from the ocean surf, from beneath the sea surface, uh, which could potentially reduce the intensity of the storm. But mm, these all, all experiments are very economically very uh, not so suitable. So still, these are experiments going on to have some low cost measures to that we can develop technology to reduce the intensity of the storm. I think the flip side of it too is that, um, you know, to understand the intensity and in, in what is happening and, and really to listen to your local officials if there is a system approaching your area and understand all those potential impacts, not necessarily just the wind impacts, but what could happen if it's raining, how much rainfall you might get if you're in a coastal area and if there's a storm surge risk, or even if you're on a, um, if you live in a river or a creek, those often can either flood from rainfall or water can get pushed back in behind them. I know this often happens in Galveston Bay. Um, um, so in Texas, so it's just being an awareness. So even though there may be different things in the works to try to reduce the intensity of storms, it's also kind of 
accepting this is how it is and just being best prepared um, for what might be coming and listening to the right folks. Um, I believe we have one more question. It's about wind shear where you had mentioned wind shear, Mansur, you sparked a question. So David would like to know, how does wind shear adversely affect hurricanes? David, that's a fantastic question. And Mansur, maybe you want to quickly um, explain what wind shear is, if we can do it in a not too technical way. Um, yeah, sure. So, yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. So th this is a very good question, and uh, wind shear is a very important parameter uh, for, for the formation and the diminishing of the hurricane. So wind shear is basically the wind at a certain altitude, uh, for example, 10, 12 kilometer from the sea, so from the surface. So the wind that the hurricane experience is called the wind shear. Now, if you have a, just a, assume a wind shear as a barrier, so it's, it acts as a barrier in front of the hurricane. If the wind shear is stronger, and uh, then when the hurricane interacts with the wind shear, it cannot, it cannot move forward, uh, uh, and then ultimately it gets diminished and weakened and diminished in the ocean. But if you have a weaker wind shear, then the hurricane can easily push that barrier. And if the storm is a, is a major category five or four storm, it can easily break down the wind shear layer and uh, hit the land in time. So yeah, wind shear is a very important factor in hurricane intensity. I always thought of wind shear too as a way, and I don't know, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost like if it is, if it can't overcome the wind shear, it almost topples the storm or pushes it off its center so that it can't stay as organized as well. Am I right in thinking that or am I not yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, wind shear also can uh, change the structure of the storm. So if you have a very well mature storm, uh, then it can easily, uh, it can easily uh, uh, become very impactful during its landfall. But if you have a uh, you know, weaker structure and then it interacts with a very strong wind shear layer along its track, uh, then it's going to be weakened very significantly before landfall. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Mansur. So I think I'm going to flip it back to talking about <laughs> forecast models yeah. um, and, and kind of getting into the crux of what your research at GSO is. And so can you really um, quickly just kind of inform our audiences, you know, what is a hurricane forecast model and, and how do they work? Yeah, so hurricane forecast models uh, can be different types. Uh, we can, hurricane forecast model can be dynamical models, which solves a mathematical equation using high computing resources. Then it can be statistical model, right? So it can use the historical storm information to make the prediction of the atmospheric uh, phenomena. Uh, so these are two of the types of model uh, that we use. And then there's the impact modeling of hurricanes, uh, which, which I am currently working on, on developing the wind impact during the landfall of hurricane. And also we have a storm surge prediction model. So in the screen, you can see one of the simulation done by our research group for landfalling hurricanes. And uh, it's a hypothetical storm making landfall in Rhode Island. We have been studying uh, to see the impact during the landfall storm. And why, so why is it important to look at these impacts of winds at landfall? Like why, what, why is that important? Yeah, so the most of the damage uh, occurs mainly during the landfall time. And so the landfall is the time when the center of the storm moves across the uh, across the coastline, and then it creates this storm surge and wind damage uh, during its uh, path uh, along its path uh, over the land. So it's very important because uh, if we can predict the uh, wind and the storm surge just before the landfall of the storm, we can be get better prepared uh, before the landfall and make people aware, and which could save lives and the economic damages and yeah, so the model that I'm working is mainly focused on that work. So what I'm doing is uh, developing this surface wind model that takes into considerations of uh, different land use characteristics and then gives the wind prediction over the land. Uh, for example, if, you, if a hurricane makes landfall in Houston area, which is highly urbanized, uh, it could have catastrophic damage then comparing to the area where it's a highly vegetated or densely po densely forested area because forest mainly works as a buffer against the wind and the storm surge. So 
the model that we are uh, developing for the wind prediction takes into consideration of those characteristics, the land use changes and land cover characteristic to make people better aware how the wind field is going to be and the, how the storm surge would look like in future. Awesome. And then, so the way that the models work, it's kind of like a, a very complex but and uh, high resolution equation, I feel like, where you have all these inputs that are being added to the system, whether it be a supercomputer or looking at historical data, et cetera. And then your output is your model that then goes into forecasts and other things. What are your inputs? Where is all the data? What tools and technologies are being used to collect the data to kind of feed these different models? Because you're obviously not able to go out and collect all the data on your right. own. So what, are, what tools are we using? So generally in the forecast model, uh, the main input is coming from the observations, observations from the satellite, observations from the buoys, and uh, then there is the observations coming from the Hurricane Hunters aircraft that, that are, are flying into the eye of the storm to get the valuable data for, for the modeling community. And then we feed those information, those observational information into our mathematical uh, model uh, which gives ultimately the forecast of the wind, uh, pressure, then rainfall, and other atmospheric phenomena. Yeah, and so Jess had brought up the, the pictures of the buoys. I don't know if you want to bring up, Jess, if you can grab it, that awesome fly-through footage we have from a, a recon, one of the aircraft reconnaissance planes. Um, they are flying, they fly basically through, they take a slice through the entire tropical cyclone system, um, and then they do an X pattern, perfect, thank you, um, to kind of cross through the eye, and then all of those different black spots that you see there on that track are where they're taking measurements, whether it be releasing a drop sonde, which is a tool that goes from the top of the hurricane all the way down to the bottom taking measurements as it descends um, or just taking other measurements um, uh, that they can from the plane itself um, but they do take a really thorough cross-section right. and all that data that they collect then uh, is fed into um, the various models and again there are a multitude of models that are available and actually the National Hurricane Center has um, a, all those different models and links to them um, on their site um, and we can share that link with all of you so that if you want to go explore all the different types of models you definitely can I think we have another question um, that it sounds like Mansur when you were talking about buffers that's where this came yeah. from this is this is our class that's out in Jamestown if I remember correctly so yep grade six here we go love this guys keep them coming what can we do in Rhode Island specifically in Jamestown to help create buffers along the coastline great question guys yeah so this, this is very 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 important question so uh, in order to create the buffer against the storm impact, uh, one of the active research area is to increase the uh, trees and the forest near the coast because they have the pro proven capacity of uh, reducing the impact uh, over the mainland. So here is one animation showing the wetland. And yeah, th this plays a very important role in storm reduction because when the storm moves, they interact with these areas of high forested land, high forested area, and it can lose the intensity very fast if they interact the density, high, high density of the forest. Great, thanks. So real quickly, because I'm watching our time here, um, one thing I definitely want to share with all of the audiences is to talk about these different forecast products. I was showing a couple of them at the beginning of this episode um, that the National Hurricane Center creates based on all these different model outputs, et cetera. Um, and I know one of them we really want to talk about, Mansur, is when they're showing um, the potential track of the hurricane or just the tropical system in general, and then it has the cone of uncertainty um, around it and what that means because I feel like this graphic is something that folks often will see perfect thank you um, so what that white kind of cone that's curving towards the coast here what does that mean could you just explain this graphic um, a little bit more for our audience's mansur yeah so during during an active hurricane season active hurricane period so we can we so we see usually this source of cone of uncertainty that we call uh, that gives us the insight like within which part the hurricane could make landfall along its track. So uh, currently, not all of the models are exactly perfect. So we, we do the probabilistic forecast, and based on the probabilistic forecast, we we get a cone of uncertainty within which the track could hit the land. So this one is one figure showing the cone of uncertainty for Hurricane Sandy, which was pretty remarkable storm. And you can see that there is a the cone of uncertainty was. Uh, really expanded from uh, Delaware to the New York, New Jersey area. 
So and the hurricane ultimately made landfall within that cone region. So this is very important to take into consideration the cone of uncertainty when you are making decision about uh, evacuation. Yeah, and I think that's um, one of the reasons why they actually, if if the audience has realized when you see hurricane or tropical storm or just tropical cyclone track graphics now, when they're showing you, they've taken away that track line because what they found is people got really focused on the track itself and didn't realize that there was always this potential for the storm to shift. I'm, I'm having a, a, a blank on what the storm's name was, was if I believe it was last year or the year before that kept moving between which coast of Florida, whether it be the East Coast or the West Coast, it kept shifting. And I remember one time the entire cone basically went up the entire peninsula of Florida because they didn't know which way it was going to go and the storm yeah. can move. I think, I think you, you, that one is the case for Hurricane Dorian because uh, for Hurricane Dorian it was very and it occurred last year in 2019 and we had this uncertainty with the cone because uh, it spent it was very slow moving and then spent a huge a very long time probably 24 hours uh, um, just before mo moving near the florida so it was very difficult to predict in which direction it would go and ultimately it did not hit uh, uh, exactly in the florida east coast but it moved along the coastline and then it uh, hit the carolina coast Right, right. And then, so this is one type of those uh, products is to make sure that everybody understands it's it's something that I feel like is commonly shared through local meteorologists, through your news, um, and you'll see them up on social media. Something else, if we can bring it up real quick, it's called Key Messages. And I know I had one for Epsilon um, that was recently put out last night. And so the Key Messages uh, tool or graphic is really nice. This is something that the National Hurricane Center primarily uses on social media. It's a way to kind of summarize what the two main graphics are that they may be showing. And then they usually give bulleted points of important things from this public advisory that they will put out that the public should be aware of um, and or any perfect, there it is. Um, so here it shows you the track of Epsilon, where it might be moving. You can see in the upper uh, graphic is the cone of uncertainty showing. Um, and it also has timestamps on it where they're predicting where the storm may be, what type of uh, category of tropical cyclone it may be at that time. And then on the bottom there, you have the time of arrival of wind speeds. So the purple, whenever you get really dark, bright colors, it's usually meaning more intense. So the purple and the reds are your intense winds. But then you can see that the winds are going to spread out pretty far from the system, but they're going to obviously, um, they will decrease in intensity. So that, and then it has the bars on it showing when they're anticipating or predicting that those winds will arrive. So these key messages do actually, again, are shared, and then they'll have the numbered um, steps or important information along the side there for individuals to be aware of. I always appreciate those because it takes sometimes a very long or, or detailed um, public advisory. It's almost like the TLDR for your hurricane or for your tropical storm that might be approaching your area. So something to definitely check out. So I'm going to move into um, the, we're going to wrap up today's uh, program. Again, thank you, Mansur, uh, for joining us. We had a lot of really great questions. Hopefully everybody now has a, a new appreciation for models, hurricane models, forecasts, uh, the different inputs and outputs, and uh, why these are very important to making really informed decisions when we have an active season like we've had so far in 2020. Uh, we all always like to round out our ocean classroom events with homework because it is a classroom program that's what we've called it so I think a lot of our assignments that we had from our previous episodes still apply here so we definitely want to stay informed um, you want to follow along with the National Hurricane Center and then listen to your National Weather Service uh, officials when storms are approaching um, you know get familiar with those forecast products Mansory did a great job explaining the cone of uncertainty and why it's important to really pay attention not just to where they're predicting where the landfall might be but where it could go and be aware know your zone if you need to evacuate are you in a flood zone check that out as well and then the last one make Make sure you're ready have a hurricane storm kit um, this is ready.gov they have a really fantastic list of what you should be putting into your um, hurricane storm kit you want to make sure you build it ahead of a potential storm and then also maintain it so you want to check on it about every six months um, I think the reminder that Teresa had last week is great. Uh, the first 72 is on you. So the first 72 hours, make sure you have provisions in your emergency kit um, if a strong storm is predicted for your area. And this is a great checklist here. Um, they have kind of your traditional stuff that goes into your supply kit and then a second page that shows some additional things um, that you might want to be adding. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Mansur, anything else to add here as some call to actions for folks to follow through with? Yeah, I would I would suggest uh, to visit the website of the National Hurricane Center, which is uh, nhc.gov, nhc.gov, and they have a very good resource. And 
try to understand the different forecast product like the one that we discussed, cone of uncertainty, arrival times of wind. And they have very good uh, resources uh, below uh, below the uh, forecast product. So they have some tutorial videos which you can watch to make more sense. And if you need any help or have any question, feel free to email me. So my email address is uh, my first name, M-A-N-S-U-R at E-R-I.edu. And I'll be happy to be in touch with you. Awesome, there you guys go. You have a hurricane expert right at your finger fingertip. I think you might be hearing from that sixth grade class in uh, Jamestown, which would be fantastic to make that connection. Sure. Yeah. I'm looking so, forward to it. Yeah. Thank you, Mansur, for that. And thank you for taking the time today to share your knowledge and expertise with all of us. Uh, thank you for everybody behind the scenes that always makes these programs work the way they work. Uh, and thank you to the Deborah Ocean Foundation for their continued support. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Without all of you in our audience, these programs honestly would not be the success that they are. Uh, continue to check out all the different websites and I'm sure that have been listed in the different uh, in both of the chat boxes lots of resources shared um, in the comments um, and visit those websites for other information on projects that were talked about today um, this is our last episode in this three-part series on hurricanes but the GSO ocean classroom program the series will continue so uh, mark your calendars on November 12th uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern so we're shifting back to our noon time slot we're gonna start a four-part series talking about framing your future so this will be really great for students, uh, focusing on pathways, education, careers, opportunities, and rain and ocean science. So mark your calendars. That's going to be something that's going to be really great to tune in for those conversations and be part of those programs. Sorry, my bad. Not November 12th, November 5th. It's November 5th at 12 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for that correction, guys. So follow along with various URI, GSO, ISC social media handles, uh, and stay tuned, like I said, for the next uh, classroom event that will be happening on November 5th. Um, and if there are other topics that you're interested in, definitely share those with us. There's a feedback form that will be shared. Uh, provide that feedback to us, and uh, we will try to weave those topics into future classroom events. Otherwise, Mansur, thank you again. This was great. Everybody out there, continue to be safe, be well, and we'll catch you again at the next classroom event. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.